Battalion of the United States 7th Cavalry readies for battle in Vietnam. The orders are simple. Find the enemy and kill him. History haunts this unit. Nearly a century ago, the 7th Cavalry, led by George Armstrong Custer, was massacred by the Sioux. No one imagined that on this November day in 1965, these young warriors, like Custer 7, would be surrounded by an angry foe intent on their destruction. These modern-day cavalrymen ride into battle not on horseback, rather they fly on steeds of metal and glass. For the Americans, everything moves by helicopter, and one ship, more than any other, shoulders the load. Bell Helicopters Huey. In the early 1960s, the United States Army set out to test a new kind of warfare based on the concept of air mobility. For thousands of years, soldiers have been enslaved by terrain. With the helicopter, infantry attack moves into the third dimension. Troops can strike at the heart of the enemy with unimagined speed. Air mobility will revolutionize the way armies fight and make the helicopter an integral part of battle. In the central highlands of Vietnam, in a distant place known as the Ya Drang Valley, air mobility will endure its first trial by fire. You're flying the helicopters and the infantry into a landing zone almost 15 miles from the nearest road, and they're out there to stay. They're going to fight. They're going to be supplied by the helicopter. They're going to use artillery support that has been jumped out there by a helicopter. This is the graduation ceremony. This is either it's going to work or we're all going to die out there. This chopper's official name is the UH-1 Iroquois. Early on, crews take those initials and dub their steed the Huey. The nickname sticks. This single rotor machine, designed by Bell, is the first helicopter to fly into combat with a turbine engine. The aircraft was designed to fit the Army's need for a faster, more powerful chopper. The Huey was relatively untested uh, against uh, uh, small arms fire and automatic weapons and certainly against anti-aircraft weapons. And so no one knew how that would come out in a combat situation. Vietnam is the first helicopter war. At one point, there are more American helicopters in Vietnam than any other country even owns. The Huey comes to symbolize the struggle. A rugged chopper serves as jeep, truck, ambulance. The UH-1 is also the world's first dedicated attack helicopter. On countless occasions, the cavalry looked to this aerial gunship for salvation. With 2.75-inch rocket pods, machine guns mounted on the sides, and a grenade launcher in the nose, it carries more firepower than the typical World War II fighter. chance encounters, Americans have yet to fight the well-trained, heavily armed troops of the North Vietnamese Army. The first CAV is given free reign by Commanding General William Westmoreland to conduct the now infamous search-and-destroy missions. Reports 
indicate sizable enemy movement into South Vietnam near the Cambodian border. Led by Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, the Americans fly to a landing zone in the Yardrang Valley known as LZ X-Ray. I picked X-Ray because it was the one clearing in the area of operations which I had been assigned which could take the most helicopters. And I wanted to get as many men on the ground as possible, as soon as possible, and as many on the first lift as I could bring in. At dawn, UH-1 crews begin the first of many missions. On a day none of them would forget, Moore and his officers fly a reconnaissance mission over LZ X-ray. Just after 10 o'clock, artillery from two nearby fire bases opens up and pounds the perimeter. The goal is to soften up the area for the incoming grunts. As the barrage lifts, Base the LZ, rockets and machine guns. Once these pull off, gunships fire on the LZ while escorting arriving troop carriers called slicks. First of some 450 U.S. troopers jump into landing zone X-ray, unaware of the odds against their survival. And I had the feeling that we were going to get into a fight in that area. And we captured a prisoner within 25 minutes uh, who was unarmed and uh, had an empty canteen. And he was obviously an outpost. And he told us through an interpreter that there were three battalions of enemy, of Vietnamese army forces on that mountain who wanted very much to kill Americans, but hadn't been able to find any. During and since the Vietnam War, the Huey's biggest impact is the movement of troops and supplies. The UH-1 forever changed the way commanders view the battlefield. Infantry company commanders and infantry battalion commanders usually only had to think at two and a half miles per hour because that's how far their troops could move on foot. So you had a map sheet that only covered two and a half kilometers. So you never really had to worry about anything outside that box. Now you have a machine that will propel you into hyperspace for, for us. So now you have a map sheet that's Instead of one little pocket size, it's four or five pages. The Huey represents a tremendous step forward in rotary wing technology. With its Lycoming T-53 turbine engine, the craft is much more reliable and more powerful than earlier piston-driven helicopters. The Huey flies at 124 knots, with a range of nearly 300 miles. In optimal flight conditions, it can carry as many as 13 people. On this combat assault mission, special forces train with the pilots and crews of the Pennsylvania National Guard. six men to a mountain ridge in central Pennsylvania is a trip that would take a day were it not for the choppers. As in Vietnam, the troops secure the LZ. The helicopters take off within seconds to move out of the range of enemy guns. Two, three, four. Four, four, jump. Once the aircraft has started and running and you've got clearance to, to take off, 
you will be using the collective to bring the aircraft up off of the ground. You'd use the cyclic input to maintain your position over the ground, and you'll be using the pedals to maintain the longitudinal axis of the aircraft so that the aircraft will stay directly over where it is as you bring it up. And if in a situation where if you had, for example, a left crosswind, you'd actually have to put a little bit of left cyclic into the uh, rotor system to maintain your position over that one spot over the ground. From that point, to take off, apply a little bit of additional collective and a little bit of forward cyclic. At that point, you'll need just a little bit of, of uh, right pedal, and that should maintain your ground track and your intended direction of takeoff. The UH-1 looks very much as it did when it was first built. Because the chopper flies many low-level missions, one modification of the Huey is a wire strike protection system. It is designed to help the ship survive running into telephone or electrical lines. If a wire came in and hit the nose of the aircraft, it could be either deflected up or down. If it was deflected down, it would come down below the chin of the aircraft. This fairly flimsy metal would come off, and then it would hit that cutter as the wire is guided into the jaws of the cutter, it actually gets snapped. If it was to hit the nose of the aircraft or above, it's guided up so that it gets up to the jaws of the wire strike kit and then just cuts the wire. In places like Yadreg, choppers took hostile fire daily. That's the main reason for this, the M60 machine gun, mounted on both sides of the slick. The 60s were manned by the door gunner and the crew chief. The 60 that we use were, were basically the infantry type, and we take the 60, roll it upside down, and use your little finger to actually operate the trigger, and, and you just work it like this. And in, in order to stop that from falling out of the aircraft, we had bungee cords. So if you, if you did get shot, or you probably had to make a you know, maneuver that you, that you wouldn't lose the 60, it wouldn't fall out of the aircraft. American chopper crews flew more than 30 million missions over Southeast Asia. This intensity forged a bond of enlisted man and officer to a degree not normally found. The uh, aircraft commander was assigned to the aircraft. It was his aircraft. He knew that. Everybody knew that. The crew chief knew it was really the crew chief's aircraft. But we humored the, the aircraft commanders. <laughs> the crew chief had the responsibility for the logbook on the aircraft. Both the crew chief and the aircraft commander did a pre-flight check every day. Looked different things sometimes. A lot of times we didn't tell the aircraft commander everything that we were looking at. We figured he had enough on his mind flying the thing. You didn't want any distractions. In Vietnam, the helicopter crews earned a reputation for going to work regardless of the hazards. Army aviators are, uh, they're a, a special breed of madman. They came when called, you know, they, they were God's lunatics, I guess you'd have to say. They just didn't know any better or didn't care. I loved doing what I did. And all of the, the, the guys I flew with, the, whether they were pilots or, or, or crew chiefs or gunners, uh, were there because they wanted to be there. Uh, went out every morning ready to go. If we didn't want to fly, all we had to say was, I don't want to fly. For those who rely on the Huey, the craft becomes more than a means of transportation. For those who fly it, like Bruce Crandall, there is a paradox to the mission. A PFC explained it all to me one day. He says, I love you sometimes, but I hate you sometimes too, because we get in contact and we know that you guys are there and you're going to take us out. If we get wounded, you'll take us out. 
you bring us food, and you bring us our supplies that we need, and uh, I love you when you're doing that, but then we win the fight, and you guys pick us up, and take us someplace else, and put us back into trouble. Thousands of North Vietnamese soldiers have spent months moving down into the Central Highlands. Their aim is to split South Vietnam in two. The Americans are aware of their presence, though they don't know their exact strength or location. On November 14, 1965, the men of the 1st of the 7th Cavalry set out to find them. Most GIs expect this to be another routine search and destroy mission. To date, the routine has been more searching than destroying. When we landed at X-ray, uh, it was fairly calm at the beginning, and then uh, it wasn't long, just a few minutes, 15 minutes uh, like that. We, uh, we headed into the uh, uh, creek bed area uh, towards the mountain, and we came under attack. Very vicious, fierce attack, and uh, all around me, in front of me, there must have been about six or eight guys that got chopped down immediately. North Vietnamese soldiers swooped down from a base camp on a nearby mountain to attack the cavalrymen. The Americans are outnumbered nearly five to one. Said, when we were being struck so savagely, I thought, man, a laugh. And I'm the first battalion of the 7th Cavalry, direct lineage from George Armstrong Custer's 7th Cavalry Regiment at the Little Bighorn in Montana in June of 1876. And it fleetingly crossed my mind that, that by God, I wouldn't let happen to us what happened to Custer and his men at the Little Bighorn. Combat is thrilling for a young, a young trooper, you know, a young grunt, 20, 22 years old. And I guess it's your, your adrenaline that kicks in, but it's extremely thrilling. I mean, not, to, not that it's enjoyable, it's just the, uh, the fear and the, uh, the shock value of it all. What spoils that thrill of excitement in combat is the, uh, the horror. The, uh, the ugliness of war, especially when you see your own. You know, their, their, their guts are out on the ground and their, their arms are mangled and their, you know, their, their legs are blowed up. And, and uh, even, even the enemy, you know, it's pitiful. You know, every, everybody dies a horrible death in combat. American casualties quickly mount for those critically wounded. Their only hope lies in swift evacuation. The Huey and its onboard medics mean that field hospitals and ample blood supplies are usually just minutes away. You had normally a three litter configuration, which you used up against the transmission wall or where you secured. The problem is when you went into a hot LZ, there was no time for that kind of stuff. So what would happen is as soon as you hit the ground, the medic and the crew chief would load the patients in, and depending on how many of them there were, put them wherever you could in here. You just laid them wherever you could on the floor so that you could get out of there as fast as you could. Once you had all of them loaded in the back and you took off, then the medic and the crew chief at altitude would start sorting out who was the priority to start to treat first and tell us located up front as to what the condition of these patients were and what kind of hospital we needed to get them to. One, four. By war's end, medevacs, known as dust-offs, will haul nearly 400,000 wounded to safety. What we were taught when we went through the medevac course was that dust-off stood for dedicated, unselfish service to our fighting forces. And it was kind of the creed of the medevac pilot that uh, 
whatever else, we weren't going to leave any of our guys on the ground wounded. So you did what you had to do to get our people out. So evacuation this morning, we have six with the three-six element, and we have three with the one-six element. The Geneva Convention prohibits the medevacs from mounting guns. Thus, they become easy targets. What the Red Crosses did was basically tell the bad guys in the tree line, you can come on out, kneel down, and get a real good aim because this is a medical helicopter and it has no guns on it. Quite often, we'd be on a medevac mission where the crew chief or the medic would say, look out to your whatever, 9 o'clock, and you'd actually see one VC come out of a tree line so that he could get a better shot at you because he knew you really didn't have much to suppress his fire with other than the M16, let's say, that your medic carried or your crew chief carried. The hoist mission was the toughest. In places where the Huey couldn't land, the medic was lured to the ground on a cable in order to pick up the wounded. The chopper remained in that vulnerable hover until all were back on board. At LZ X-ray, heavy enemy fire pours through the landing zone. Calf medevacs are prohibited from touching down in a hot LZ and they abort. Instead, the pilots and crews of the assault companies haul out the wounded at the deck. Those flying into x have a clear view of the battle raging beneath him. On his fifth drop of the day, Bruce Crandall watches helplessly as enemy soldiers penetrate the landing zone. He was there, and there was nothing I could do about it. As I touched down, uh, he, he came up and started firing and shooting at people, uh, and he killed the uh, radio operator sitting in the center of, uh, of the helicopter. Uh, got my crew chief in the throat. Uh, when I came out of there, I had uh, three dead and uh, three wounded on the aircraft. Our aircraft was severely damaged. We couldn't fly it anymore, so we switched to a new one and got that up. And we knew we'd have to go back in. Since our unit, as a bunch of as, as pilots, had never been under that kind of direct intensity and heavy volume of fire, it was not only our aircraft hit, almost all of our eight aircraft that went in, we had six of them that were damaged. Early in the war, the Vietnamese are terrified of the helicopter and the weapons it carries. The M60 machine gun fires at a rate of 550 rounds per minute. Americans flying at treetop level wreak devastation on those below. American helicopters show up, VC run, and they're cut down in strike. Telling soldiers from civilian is often impossible. But the Viet Cong begin training to fight the helicopter. The hunter becomes the hunted. They learned if you stood your ground and fought back, you could make things come out your way. They learned how to lead a helicopter like you lead a duck or a covey of quail when you're bird hunting. And they did a whole lot of training. It was very crude and it didn't always work, but they got better at it. They were endlessly adaptable, the VC. This chart had been tacked to a tree and what the VC were doing that day was holding class on how to shoot down American helicopters. This up here in Vietnamese says gun sight, where to aim to shoot down helicopters. This is the gun sight here, and you can notice the aircraft way back here, and you can see the writing, and then this little writing in red with the number five, which basically says when the aircraft is straight and level, leading by about five helicopter lengths. This one shows you if you're doing a normal takeoff. In other words, when a helicopter takes off, very rarely does it come straight up. 
it normally accelerates forward and climbs. So you'll notice the gun sight is located in front and above the helicopter so as to allow you to fly again into his line of fire. When we landed to have the wounded picked up, uh, I guess as a thank you for getting them, this was given to me by the uh, people on the ground. More than 4,800 helicopter crewmen were killed, and more than 2,000 UH-1s were lost to hostile fire in Southeast Asia. Countless others were damaged but made it home, testimony to the craft's resilience. In combat, the aircraft could take 20 or 30 rounds and continue to fly because no critical part was hit. For example, it could go through here and straight through the other side and never affect any component that was necessary for flight. It's really between you and the gods. Uh, if, if luck is on your side today and one round didn't hit one very important component, yes, you'd be okay. As a measure of protection, the crews in Vietnam are issued body armor, known as the chicken plate. It's heavy, it's hot, it's uh, uncomfortable to wear. I used it to sit on. Uh, I always thought it was a macho type thing, but you know, not to wear it, but I always thought the chances of a round coming straight at you it's not going to be all that great because that'd be like an air-to-air you know, air -air type fight. Most of the people shooting at you are going to be shooting from the ground up, so I'd rather have my bottom side covered because the rounds are coming through the bottom of the aircraft. Now, I would put it on every now and then when we go into a hot LZ. Looking at an LZ with the tracers bouncing off the ground and bouncing off trees and realizing we're about to go in there, Decide that you're dead. That's it. If I go in there, I'm not coming out. But let's go. Once you make that decision, you accept that. Um, you continue to operate. Uh, but it changes you. Just past noon on the first day, LZ X-ray is shut down. With enemy soldiers in the landing zone, now Moore cannot risk losing units. Crews are forced to return to base, knowing that at some point they will go back. The worst part, mentally, was the waiting. When you're sitting around waiting, you've got a lot of time to think. Uh, you have an awful lot of time in your hands to think. It seemed like uh, it just took an eternity to, to uh, sometimes to get back off and go to this place where, well, you weren't really sure you're going to come back out alive. Huey driver Lee Komich was just 25 years old when he flew into X-ray. This film of him was taken by fellow pilot John Mills. When we sat and then got ready, it was like, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to go back in or whatever? So we called for volunteers to go with us. We never knew what really would show up at that time when the call came. So when uh, Colonel Moore called for the reinforcements for the next lift, then just everybody got back in the aircraft and uh, we then picked up the next group of infantry and headed back in, knowing that we were going to encounter just what we had left before. I mean, this was a bad place. Uh, this was not a safe place to be. However, we knew that it was our comrades, we knew that it was our countrymen on the ground and swallowed, uh, although our throats were probably pretty dry, and just went on in. It was not what I wanted to do. Um, I, I can remember at one point thinking, gee whiz, if we weren't su supporting Americans, I don't believe I'd do this. 1,500 feet above the battlefield flies a command and control chopper. Outfitted with a bank of radios, this Huey enables commanding officers and support staff to observe their men from a safe distance. Artillery officer Dudley Tatamy rides aboard a CNC bird above the Yadrang Valley. 
it was the brigade commander's airborne sedan that he could use to get to and from places. From the commander's perspective, it was a great thing to have. If you were a, uh, a smaller unit commander, um, you might have been apprehensive about the fact that now uh, your boss could drop in at any moment unannounced from out of nowhere uh, to visit your location unannounced. The situation at LZ X-Ray is bleak. Huey crews are ordered back into the sky to relieve the beleaguered troops of the 1st of the 7th. When we finally got the word to pick up ammunition and go back to LZ X-Ray, uh, the LZ was easy to find. There was a lot of smoke billowing from the LZ. As we got into trouble, you could hear people come on the radio. Where in the hell are they at? And you get a lot of a lot of screaming and hollering, and uh, people were clearly in trouble. People were clearly frightened to death. It really uh, turned your stomach. Late in the afternoon, Moore's command post is in danger of being overrun. Huey crews drop in reinforcements. Within seconds, they rush to block an NVA thrust aimed at the exposed flank of the Americans. As enemy tracers break across his command post, Hal Moore calls in all of the firepower he can get. by at two fire bases. A1E Sky Rangers joined the battle from above. This dive bomb, developed at the end of World War II, can loiter for hours, attacking targets with both 20 millimeter cannon and more than 10,000 pounds of bombs. also stand cocked and ready to go. These choppers are loaded with 48 rockets and up to 8 machine guns. They are like knife fighters, able to hover in close and fire with deadly accuracy. Uh, Hotel 49 looks like they'll be landing down south of that dark spot on the center there. We'll try to aim towards the... Uh... So when they called in firepower, artillery, or ARA, it was in on us also. And I remember uh, at least one or two times we had to pull back. And that was when we were uh, making assaults across the creek bed that we got out too far. And uh, we were taking casualties, friendly casualties ourselves, from our own uh, explosive, you know. The Americans will not survive without close artillery support. Dudley Tatamy circles above the battlefield that day in a command and control chopper. He listens as a captain radios for help. Works of the fact that if it isn't close enough where I can feel it going over and some of the shrapnel going over ain't close enough. When you get involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, you can expect that there will be some friendlies and opposing elements uh, intermingle. And the bad feelings that you always end up with is uh, whether or not some of the, some of whether or not your actions were responsible for the loss. Um, and so you, you learn to uh, adjust and live with that. 
had it not been for our air power, ARA, the UEs, our Sky Raiders dropping bombs, and tables could have been turned the other way. I might not be here today. I feel real strong about that too. As darkness settles on the Yadrang Valley, the Huey crews shot down for the night. The men on the ground dig in. exhausted. It was a very hot that day and we were moving constantly, at least I was. And uh, I was pretty much out in the open of, of the first hours. And that night uh, I was out there in the open again laying flat as a uh, listening post. Nighttime's scary. You know, it's uh, <laughs> you see things moving that aren't. You know, bushes are moving and uh, trees are moving and, and your imagination, you know, you're a nervous wreck anyhow from what you've seen earlier that day. And uh, so you imagine everybody sneaking in to try to kill you. We had flares, uh, illumination, of, you know, dropping out of the sky and, and it lit up the area very, very bright, like day, daylight, you know, you could see every blade of grass. And, uh, and uh, I imagine the enemy could see us, too. I don't know. But that's the way we felt, you know, that uh, we were spotlighted also. On a machine gun, every fifth round is a tracer. And at nighttime, you, you really don't want to fire uh, your weapon if you don't have to, you know, unless you're being directly assaulted, because you don't want to give away your position because so tracers work both ways. And, uh, they, they not only mark the target you're trying to hit, uh, the enemy can see where it's coming from also, and they can pinpoint your location. We had the red tracers, they had the green and the orange tracers, the North Vietnamese. So if you saw green tracers coming at you, or, or orange ones, you knew it was the enemy. So you just fire from wherever they're coming from, you probably hit the target. You could pretty much see when uh, a North Vietnamese would be shot because uh, all of a sudden the uh, orange or green tracers would shoot straight up in the sky. So, you know, it would be a, a North Vietnamese would fall down with his finger on the trigger. Day two begins with a mad minute. Every man opens up his weapon on full automatic. orders to just pick a spot where we were facing out from our perimeter and do a mad minute. It may have lasted three minutes, but just to clear your weapon and fire at anything that's out there. You know, it might be sneaking up on you. So it worked. A few people fell out of trees, you know, North Vietnamese. Dawn, November 15th. The battle rages for a second day. For the cavalrymen, it is another day in violent combat with a persistent foe. The Vietnamese attack in waves, and the fighting continues at this ferocious pace all day and into a second night. By the morning of the 16th, the enemy is gone. After 48 hours of combat, the North Vietnamese pull back. Americans police the battlefield, collect enemy weapons, and their own dead. For the Americans, there are 79 killed and 121 wounded. North Vietnamese casualties are estimated to be 10 times higher. Thus, it is declared a victory. We policed that battlefield, we walked across enemy dead, we picked up their weapons, we survived, they quit the fight and retreated. I call that a victory when you can walk across the enemy dead and pick up their weapons. The tone of victory is high.
UPI reporter Joe Galloway rode into X-Ray the first night. He describes his photos. I look at the faces. And I see how, basically, how calm everyone is. There's no panic. There's almost, if anything, resigned attitude. I look also and I see the feet, the boots, where they're wrapped in their poncho. Maybe the only thing you see are those, those two boots sticking out the end of it. And, you know, that guy sat down last night or whenever and laced those boots up. And now he did. The first of the Seventh Cavalry has ridden into another valley, fought another enemy. But this outcome is different. The fate which claimed George Armstrong Custer at Little Bighorn is averted by Hal Moore and his troopers. I felt very proud of what my men had done. I felt very saddened at having lost so many men. And I felt guilty that I was still alive so many of my men were dead. The survivors from the 1st of the 7th are pulled out of X-ray. Air mobility, with the help of massive American firepower, has withstood its first large-scale test. The portion of the air mobile concept was definitely validated we did not use helicopters in X-ray to envelop the enemy in a, in a flowing three-day battle. We were in a perimeter, uh, fighting off wave after wave of, of attacks by the enemy. We could not have succeeded in doing that had we not had air mobility in the form of Huey helicopters bringing us ammo and water. I think if we had attempted to destroy that enemy by simply groping and plodding our way through the jungles on the ground, we would have worn out our men, and they would have had the advantage. This is their turf. They knew it better than we did. The next day, November 17th, air mobility would again be tested. This time, the outcome will raise the haunting memory of Custer. Takeoff time for the first cell is 0500 local. Climb out on the standard departure route, level off at Point the Bravo. The morning of November 17th, the 52 pilots and crews Point prepare Delta. for their first tactical strike of the Vietnam War. Their mission, to bomb suspected enemy positions surrounding landing zone X-ray. Point Delta, start climb to flight level 360. Open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on X-ray 3-0. The men who have replaced the first of the seventh need to get out of range of the bombers. I don't want anybody with their flak jacket or their steel pot off. Is that understood? Can anybody not hear that? For reasons lost to history, those troopers, the second battalion of the seventh cavalry, are ordered to walk out of X-ray. Their destination is LZ Albany, two miles from X-ray through enemy-held territory. They leave any connection with air mobility behind. With no helicopters, no security, and no forward reconnaissance, the men march out of X-ray in a column the way soldiers have done for millennia. After walking three hours, the Americans stumble upon the enemy. The second of the seventh is ambushed in a furious and savage attack. They took the Americans by surprise. And strung out over 600 yards of jungle 
they cut the column into pieces like you chop the head off a snake and then just segment it with a hoe. They were attacking through the column, cutting it into pieces. And except for defensible perimeters at the head and tail of this column, everybody else in the middle was fair game. And they were fighting and dying by ones and twos and threes. The confusion on the ground prevents those aboard a command and control Huey above the battlefield from helping the Americans below. It was a very dense canopy, and all you could see were little streamers of smoke coming out of a lot of directions. Uh, and I remember uh, somebody saying, uh, uh, get the artillery in, and uh, oh, where's the artillery? And I remember telling Colonel Brown that I couldn't, I couldn't do it uh, now because we didn't know where anybody was at this particular point. And Bartholomew is making passes over the guys. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm coming in. Tell me where you are from the sound of my rotor blades. At nightfall, Huey crews are sent in to pull out the wounded and drop in reinforcements, some of whom had just fought at X-ray. By then, we were dog tired, and, and there had been an awful lot of activity. And I can remember knowing that this place was very, very hot. I can remember the dry throat, and, and I was frightened to go. Cross three sixes is on one one. One minute north. I have the tracer fire in sight. Over. The firefight broke out in the LZ, and it looked like a laser show. Tracers were just lacing back and forth uh, across the LZ itself. I truly don't know how the North Vietnamese gunners didn't lock on to our Hueys and, and do us a job. For those on the ground, it goes beyond hell. The enemy were walking around shooting the wounded, shooting their prisoners, shooting anybody they found. Total carnage, bodies so closely mixed, there are guys with uh, bayonets, guys with their hands tied behind them, they've been shot. It was probably the most horrifying experience that I've ever had. Uh, it convinced me that uh, there was, and I think Larry Gwynn said this, there's no glory in, in war, there's only tragedy. And there's only death. To prevent a massacre, U.S. artillery is called in, virtually, on top of the cavalrymen. The enemy left. They had gone in and policed up most of their bodies, and they had taken some napalm, they had taken artillery, and they'd lost a lot of casualties of their own, and they, they policed up what they could, and they left. And the fight was over. But as far as that being anything but luck, I don't know what it would be. They just, they, they'd done what they set out to do, and they left. The death toll for the Americans is 155. Only three days after the battle at X-ray, North Vietnamese have learned how to blunt the American advantage, get in so close that technology is rendered useless. They were afraid of what this new way of warfare was going to mean, what the helicopter was going to mean, and they wanted to blood their soldiers, they wanted to test their tactics against ours, and find some way for a peasant army to deal with the highest tech army then operating in the world. They learned how the only way that they could survive under the firestorm was to get under that, get in, grab them by the belt buckle, and make them fight us one-on-one. -on -one. 
where the only firepower then that matters is hand grenade and rifle and bayonet. And then it doesn't matter how high tech you are, it matters what's in your heart. The battles in the Yadrang Valley prove that a technological advantage does not guarantee victory. Though thousands of their soldiers perished at X-ray, NVA commanders considered the battle a victory. In the end, they were willing to pay any price to expel the foreigners. But in 1965, U.S. policymakers were unable or unwilling to recognize this. Instead, they too look at X-ray as a victory. Convinced that Americans and their firepower could win the war, the Johnson administration doubled the number of soldiers in Vietnam to 400,000. By 1966, 15,000 young Americans were arriving in Southeast Asia every month. Many would ride into battle on the UH-1 Huey. Once there, they would find themselves ensnared in a guerrilla war. Received success at X ray prolonged the war for the Americans. We look back and we realize that if we had not fought that fight, that that war might have been over sooner. And the idea that the air mobile concept was good and, and our politicians decided to continue the war, nobody told us to win it. And that's where, if, if we were going to expend that kind of resource, uh, we certainly should have been trying to win. For the actions in the Yadrang Valley, the first of the seventh would be recommended for a presidential unit citation, the highest unit level decoration awarded by the Army. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moores, first of the seventh cavalry, fought and died in unprecedented numbers in a valley in Vietnam. If not for the work of Huey pilots and crews, the troopers would have known a similar fate that befell George Armstrong Custer at Little Bighorn. I think Moore would be as famous as Custer. And uh, the helicopters kept him from being that famous. And then I think if Custer had had a couple of my helicopters, uh, we'd never heard of him either. I knew that we would prevail. We had fire support in massive quantities, and I had a disciplined bunch of men. fight, and fight hard, and fight to the death. The helicopters made a difference in the, in the fact that he had to have ammo, and uh, he had to get his wounded on. A lot of my men only had 10 days left to serve in the Army when they went into this battle. And a lot of them came home in boxes. Not one of them backed up. <laughs> 